What is up, my fellow side hustlers? This is your friend and host, Ryan Helms. I want to welcome you to the Hustle to Freedom podcast. Every week, I bring you interviews with everyday people who are creating extraordinary side hustles. And this week is no different. If you're looking to take your side hustle to the next level as well, you need to check out the Side Hustle Journal. It's the only journal on the market focused on helping side hustlers like you expedite the process of starting and growing a profitable business in your spare time, no matter how busy life may be. And for a limited time, I'm giving away a free copy of the Side Hustle Journal to anyone who leaves a review on the podcast. All you need to do is leave a review, take a screenshot, and send me an email to hello at gritandhustle.co. That's hello at gritandhustle.co. I'll send you the link to pick up your free copy. All you need to do is cover shipping. Now... On to today's episode. I'm with Jeff Weiner, who is one of the co-founders of a SaaS startup called Real Quantum. If you're not familiar with the term SaaS, it stands for Software as a Service. But before we dive into a side hustle, I wanted to ask Jeff why he decided to get involved with this startup because he already has a full plate being married with two kids and Vice President of Product, Marketing, and Sales at a technology company. So let's not waste any time and hear why he is taking on this challenge. You know, really for me, the goal was I wanted to be part of starting my own thing. I wanted to be an entrepreneur before I was too old. And I guess, you know, nobody's ever too old. But this is a really good point in my life. I have two wonderful daughters, a senior in college and a senior in high school. They're, I'm blessed to that they're doing their own thing. They're successful. And so I think to myself, if I'm going to ever do it, I'd better do it now before it's too late for me. And that's really why. And so I love what I do in my current role at Mersoft. It's a great company. I'm doing great things. Um, and I'm really leveraging very much of the same skill set in this new venture. So what your your current startup now is called Real Quantum. What exactly are you guys doing at Real Quantum? So Real Quantum is a SaaS product, as you mentioned. Its purpose is to offer um, a new way of operating for commercial real estate appraisers. So just to, really quickly, um, commercial real estate, huge driver of the economy, not just in the U.S., but globally. The appraisal business is how people value what that real estate's worth, what it's worth now, what it could be worth in the future. That process is so incredibly manually intensive today. It really is an industry that has been forgotten um, for, with technology. And things are starting to catch up. Things are getting exciting. But really, there's an opportunity to bring these professionals who are very highly skilled, very much in demand, and spending way too much time using spreadsheets, using word processors, and instead of applying their skills. Um, and so we've created this product that's really designed to just eliminate a lot of that headache, a lot of the paperwork. It pulls everything into the web. It's Everything can be done in a browser or on a mobile device. And whereas other industries have already accomplished many of those things, this one has not yet. And so that's where our focus is. So what does the uh, commercial appraiser, what does the typical workflow to someone not using a product like yours, what does that look like versus what you offer? Right. It's a great question. So an appraiser will um, bid and get a, get a job for anything. The thing about commercial as opposed to residential. So if anybody who owns a home, they've had an appraisal done for their house and they're pretty standard. The appraiser comes out to their house, they take some measurements, a bunch of pictures, and they write up a very standard report 
and your bank gets it and then you get it. You can see how much your house is worth compared to some others in your neighborhood. So commercial is essentially similar, except that it could be instead of a house, it could be a hotel or it could be a golf course or it could be a car dealership. It could be all kinds of different things. And each one of them has different, um, different things that are important to evaluate. Um, and then um, addressing how you compare that value to other places. It can be what other, other properties are similar to that. So without our product, what um, they would do is they would typically go out and they would measure and assess and visit the property. They would um, then have to request, say if it's a apartment building or, or a, re a retail shop, what the records are for all the rent. What is the property tax history? What are some features or factors that are important about the property they might have to get from the county? Um, if there's been comparable properties that have sold somewhere in the city, um, they probably have to go to some other appraiser to get them because they're not readily available. Or if they're in a small town, they might not have anything. So they take all that, plus all their pictures and spreadsheets, and they pull it all together, manually and create this report that then they probably have clerical staff to help format it. And it goes through a bunch of reviews internally. And then it's finally delivered, usually to somebody who's at a bank, like a lender, or maybe a property developer or somebody like that. So that's how it basically occurs for many people today. So it sounds like you guys, you have a product, but what you're really selling is time. You're, you're selling time in that it sounds like a much more efficient workflow for an appraiser versus what they would be doing. Is that accurate? It is. So it's, well, it's time is one of the big factors because there's a lot of this, this effort that's wasted in all this manual, you know, spreadsheet jockeying and all that kind of thing. The other thing too is, is all that manual collection of data introduces all kinds of opportunities for errors. And so, you know, somewhere along the line, somebody will screw up a formula in a spreadsheet and they'll get all the way through to the end. It'll go to the customer who ordered it and there'll be a mistake and it'll make them look really bad because that is what their end product is. The report is the, is the packaging of all their advice, their expert assessment of what could be, you know, might be a couple hundred thousand dollars for a little convenience store. It could be tens of millions of dollars for some large property. So the stakes can be really high. So the second thing is, um, is accuracy. And then the third one that's actually a big deal is, um, is security. So right now, if you did all that, you've got lots of files and pictures on your hard drives. You might have servers that your office uses. Some even still have file cabinets full of all this stuff, <laughs> <laughs> which is a whole other problem, right? The, the amount of file cabinets you see in this industry is unlike any of the other spaces that I work in. Um, but, but um, all that stuff is very exposed. It could be, you could have malware in your computer and it could, or it could crash or somebody could walk off with files who's a disgruntled former employee or who knows what. So there's just lots of opportunities for security to be a problem too. So how, how did you get involved with this? Because, I mean, looking at your background, you, you do have some uh, technology um, experience, but mm -hmm. how did you really get into this particular uh, SaaS startup. So I've been in and around technology the whole my whole career. I'm originally an IT and finance grad, and I did um, software development for a few years and went up through the IT management, software management track, and switched over to sales and marketing several years ago. Um, but uh, I really had um, have developed some wonderful friends and connections over the years, and that's how. I found out about this opportunity. The CEO and the CTO and the, and the mobile chief mobile developer were all people I've worked with before. Tremendous respect for them, um, for their technology skills, for their character as human beings. So I knew all of them already and had the opportunity to, this came up and we got talking. I did not know the half of our founding team that are the commercial real estate appraisal experts. Um, they did. I had the opportunity to meet them. I um, was also impressed by their expertise and their character. And uh, that was a little over a year ago. And we've been going at it ever since. Did, so did you know this was 
uh, such a, a big opportunity as far as the industry before they explained it to you or, or was this kind of shedding light for you? You know, um, so I was not familiar with commercial real estate and certainly not the appraisal business um, side of things. But one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do in my current role is, um, is really have had the opportunity to meet several people um, who wanted to start a technology product. And usually what it was, it could, because um, Microsoft does a lot of uh, custom software development and has it over the years. So entrepreneurs come to us and say, we have this idea, we want you to help us build it and all that sort of thing. I always either met um, business people that were non-technical, the business people, and they would almost always say, all I have to do is get some people in India or Vietnam to code this thing and I'll be rich. Right? <laughs> they completely devalue the technology complexity. But it was amazing. It happened the same way with the technology people, a technology entrepreneur will come and say, all I have to do is build this product and people will come buy it and I'll be rich. And, they, and even when they got together, often the business and the technology experts would not really appreciate the value that the other contributor had and it never gelled. Um, so I could see that a lot. Um, but one of the first things that I observed about the Raquan team, because they had been in at this for about 18 months before I got involved, is that um, they had both. They had really strong expertise that was widely, re highly regarded in the industry, the commercial side. And, and I already knew the technology people and they knew their stuff and I had a lot of respect for them. And I observed when they got together that they had mutual respect for what the other team could deliver. And that was so rare. And I thought it was something special. So knowing that and, and I did my due diligence too to see what other products were in the market, what the um, addressable target market could be and those types of things. And from a, a business on paper sense, it looked good too. You, uh, you named a few people yourself, I think a CTO, a CEO. Uh, how, how many others are involved in this right now? You know, we have a pretty big team. They have uh, nine founders, um, four commercial real estate appraisal experts, um, four technology people, and then one designer. So um, that rounds out our, our current founding team. And a uh, wonderful mix of skill sets. In addition to that, our first hire was um, a customer success manager who's doing an awesome job. Is this anyone's full-time job right now? Um, so our CTO is currently a full-time contractor for the company. That's just how it made sense to work it out. So our CTO is our lead developer, and um, and he's full-time. Our customer service, our customer success manager, she's not quite full-time. Um, she's, I think, maybe 30 hours a week as we're ramping up because we have a handful of customers that's working out fine right now. And uh, probably our next hire is going to be a QA Person. You know, it seems like it often it can be uh, difficult to find just one or two co-founders and, and you guys kind of early on got a, a big handful. Was it was it difficult to get everyone aligned with a, a common vision? You know, we always have. Um, I guess the short answer is no, but I don't want to simplify it. Um, we do challenge each other's assumptions. We don't always agree. Um, we don't have any passive individuals. But uh, so far, um, and I just say that so far because, you know, we haven't been together for years. Um, we've been doing pretty remarkable in terms of collaborating and continuing that mutual respect um, the whole way. And are you guys just central to the Kansas City area? We are. That's the other thing that's actually helpful is this, a lot of startups actually will draw people from different parts of the world. We are physically in the same city. And uh, the typical recipe for us is that, um, well, I should say also that um, the commercial real estate appraisal founders have made space for our startup in their office. Hmm. We pay a little rent for that, but we get a wonderful price. Right. So we're not in a co-working space. We're not in somebody's basement or garage. Um, and 
basically activity turns to the startup uh, for everybody who's got it as a side hustle after the regular work day and Saturdays in the office are as busy as any Monday. Mm. I want to deviate from the product for a minute and, and kind of jump into a personal question. How do you, or maybe the better question is, do you have any struggles managing your career, this side hustle and any family activities? Yeah. So Ryan, it's always a challenge and that's probably one of the keys you want to touch on, right? Um, it's hard. I mean, um, my regular day job is a, is a pretty typical 45 to 55 hour week. There's travel fairly often. And, um, and that's, and it's, it's busy. It's not a nine to five. It's, it's, um, I have a lot of responsibility and, and stuff happens at night and on the weekend. So that's, it's, it keeps me on my toes. Um, fortunately I enjoy doing it. I don't, I don't get up and think, all right, now how many more weeks do I have to do this job before I can bail and do my side hustle? No, I, I love it. Um, but that means it's, it's a lot of time. And so row quantum is in the evenings and it's a, usually a 10 hour day on Saturday and half a day on Sunday. Um, and fortunately my home life is working really nicely. Like I said, my daughters are pretty much, um, and with the exception of needing a steady stream of money, <laughs> <laughs> all the money goes to college and will soon go to the second kid's college. Um, they're doing wonderful. And my wife has been tremendously supportive as well. So, so far, so good. That That's awesome. There's not a lot of room for personal time. That's all. Yeah, no, I, I can, I can sympathize with that. So you hit on, uh, obviously your, your daughters need money as well to live. I want to hit on the uh, the software product, though. How are you guys funding that? We are 100% bootstrapped. And so um, one of the things that we have as a benefit is, um, is eight of our nine founders are fairly long in their careers, and they're in a position to do that. And that's a big help, right? We're not... We're not um, scraping together funds on our own. And that's, I think that's important too, because one of the things I was reading, I was, I was just reading this past week, what should um, a startup pay its early founders who go on full time? And the consensus of reading and listening to a couple of different podcasts is that it needs to be modest, but it can't be so low that you're worried about living, right? You're worried about paying your bills. And so, um, I know a lot of founders struggle with that. So in our case, we've got people that are all, all pretty long in their careers and they're able to do that so far. Now we knew, do need to get funding to grow. Um, and we're also pursuing that as well, but that takes a while. So are you guys at a point now where you've hit limitations on how much you can scale due to funding? Um, not yet. We are early on. Um, we don't have thousands of customers. And um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to be very smart about how we're spending. And um, our goal is to um, invest every dollar that we earn in revenue for the foreseeable future. So revenue is going to feed as much of that as possible. Um, I'm sure we'll do some more capital calls. And then at the point at which we're ready to we've really settled into our model right because we're big followers of the lean startup right so you want to get your product market fit for a while don't grow too soon validate it validate the processes inside your company and once you're ready to have got that settled then you scale and so we're not to that point to do that when we are then it'll be time for funding when you came into the uh to the business were they already through that validation phase no, we just started selling this year, January. Can you explain how you guys validated uh, your product on the market? You know, um, I, I would say that if if we hadn't um, had enough expertise as we do, it might have been harder. We're pretty confident in the product validation at this point, though. So we're very early on in the number of customers we have. But what we are getting is the customers that are joining 
are joining in a way that we had predicted, generally speaking. Um, like, for example, we're starting with smaller shops. Smaller shops have less likelihood to have an entrenched process, fewer decision makers, easier to decide, and that's starting to happen. We get validation from people that have expressed interest and not yet purchased that validates what it is. We've had people say, you know, I need you to do A, B, and C before I'm ready. A, B, and C, or at least A and B, are usually already on our roadmap. So all those things are validations that we're pointing in the right direction, which I think the, the only reason that we're, um, we're to that point is because we have the benefit of having really, really deep understanding about what the market is. So for these early adopters of the product, is the is the pricing model set in stone or, or do you guys look at the uh, customer and the opportunity and kind of uh, make it fit that, that potential opportunity? You know, it's a good question. So it is a B2B sale, but um, the prices are fixed. We're also only selling annually. We're not selling month to month. Um, we're selling annually, but we're selling it at a discount for the early, these early customers. Hmm. Pretty, pretty aggressive discount. And the goal is, is to get as many of them in as possible. Um, we know as we're selling, we're, we have an MVP, or I should say a minimum sellable product, right? which is different than an MVP and MSP. We do feel confident in that, but there are some things that we need to add. So we want to get people in. We want to get people trying it and open to it. We need to get people who have, who can test, you know, provide testimonial. Hey, hey, this is a really good product. Refer their coworkers and their colleagues. And after we get that momentum, well, then end the big discount and set it to what our price is. And we've, we're not quite set on what that, that regular price will become, but we're pretty close. Is it your role within the startup here to acquire business? Is that part of your scope? Yes. So we're taking a pretty traditional definition of the marketing function for a SaaS product. And so my job is to generate at least marketing qualified leads and preferably as close to sales qualified leads as possible. You know, are you doing social marketing, social media marketing or doing, you know, inbound marketing? We've got a, um, you know, I started over a year ago, but we only sold, started selling in January. So I had about a solid year to build um, brand awareness and to, so they say in, in marketing, you kind of chop your, your social media marketing, other things in the thirds, right? Brand awareness, a third, um, um, thought leadership, a third, and then call to action, a third. So we kind of just focused on those first two and then brand awareness and thought leadership built a, a really good library of blogs. We're doing that. We went to the national conference and really just met people and talked to them and asked for their feedback things like that spent that whole year building up that momentum so people knew about us and then when we could start selling we added that third one in the call to action so okay now it's time come try us out how has it been so in your your quote unquote nine to five you have a team around you you're um you're one of the managers you're one of the leaders within your company there in this startup you're not. So how how has that been for you not having such a big team? Are you are you executing on some of this stuff yourself? Or are you guys outsourcing some of these tasks? How are you doing that? That's a good question. Um, so our team at Mersoft is not very large anyway. So, um, but but to answer your question specifically, um, um, the vast majority, probably eighty percent of the work that's in the marketing function is performed by me personally. And that's one of the keys. You know, when you talk about hiring, so you say, when should you hire your first CMO? Well, we already have that person because he's one of the founders. And they always say, look out because you hire somebody that's some high powered person who is super successful and they're from some well-known brand and they come in and they start barking orders at all these people that they're used to having. There's nobody but them. <laughs> because they don't know how to do that. So what I'm looking for, what I've enjoyed is that it's forced me to do it myself. Not only am I learning and doing things that I might not have learned at the level of detail that I am, but then I'll have a greater appreciation for how to assess the quality 
more effectively than others, and I can gradually grow that function. Yeah, and that I think has worked. It's working pretty well. Yeah, I imagine actually getting in the trenches and and producing this content has really helped you get up to speed with the industry, being that you're you're somewhat of an outsider to it. So I can definitely see the value in that. Yeah. So Ryan, that's a good point. So one of the things in particular is, is um, as far as the thought leadership goes, we like our social media presence to have current news that's always flowing. So I'm the one that's actually consuming all of that and then publishing it out into Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And so I'm consuming all that content and it really has helped a lot. And it didn't hurt though, that I kind of like the whole real estate financial thing. My bachelor's, I double majored in finance. And so it's, it was, it's fun anyway for me, but you're right. If I had some social media content person out there, um, curating articles, I wouldn't be reading any of them. Yeah. Yeah. And you hit on another point that uh, I resonate with as well. And that's kind of, if you've done it before, you can judge the quality going forward and you can, you can better instruct someone. So if you do hire that person or outsource that task, then you know, you can give them more specific instructions on how it should be done and gauge the quality of what you receive. So I think that's a a big point as well. It it is, you know, um, and that's, that's a key. So we have the benefit of, of, of working with a brilliant, graphic designer. She's just really talented. She, she's not very old. She's very young still. She just has, she's just very talented. And I've learned so much working with her directly. If I was working with an ad agency, there would be three levels between me and her. And it would just be vendor management. So I've learned a lot from her. She's taught me a lot. Um, and it'll make me a better consumer of graphic design services going forward. Yeah. Yeah. So do you guys have any competitors in the landscape right now, either locally or nationally? Definitely nationally. Um, we do. We have a couple of them that are kind of old school and haven't been innovating as fast. And we have a couple of new upstarts. And then depending on the challenges, of course, is, is that, um, you know, we're trying to cut our own path to offer our own distinct product to the marketplace. So we try not to get, uh, I can say it's good to be a little paranoid, but we still have to run our own race hmm. and we're trying to figure that out. So I spend a lot of time keeping an eye on our competitors, um, but trying not to let it get to me too much. <laughs> how much of, how much of your offering is proprietary versus, um, it could easily be replicated. Well, the challenge with SaaS products overall is that it's possible to be a fast follower. Hmm. So it's possible if you have an understanding of the industry to take any feature set from a SaaS product and just map it out. Like we're, um, we're using a a web conferencing tool here to facilitate this discussion. There are many of them that are available. And I know the product owner of this product probably is on all the other competitors products, watching press releases and see what's coming out next. Um, but knowing the feature and being able to implement it as effectively is a different thing. So I think that, uh, that um, you know, seeing what buttons and options exist on our product, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Implementing them in the way that we have, we got some pretty unique capabilities. We, um, we have the benefit of some really good architects who are setting us up not just for in the short term where we're looking now, but looking several years out. We're absolutely going to scale beautifully. We're going to be rock solid on our data integrity and our security. Those kinds of things are things that other startups, usually they build one MSP or MVP, and then they totally have to trash and start over again, right? And probably do that twice. I don't think we're in that spot. So... What has been up until this point? You guys are how many a year and a half into this? Is that what you said? So the total lifespan of the company is about two and a half years now. Two and a half years. With the time that you've been involved, what has been the biggest challenge you guys have encountered thus far? Um, 
<laughs> we uh, the the hardest thing for us has been figuring out um, when the product was ready for sale. We didn't want to sell it before it was ready, and um, you know, I guess our our product owner is brilliant at commercial real estate appraisal. He is somewhat new to the technology space, and our technologist is brilliant in technology, but fairly new to the commercial real estate space. So it was not really straightforward for them to estimate different chunks of the system to be developed. And because um, on the technology side, quality is a constant. Time and budget can vary, but quality never does. And um, that makes it frustrating when I'm driving to a market launch date that then moves. I get frustrated, but I know the product's going to be good when they do it. So that was tough, but I don't look back at it and think we wasted a bunch of time. We didn't at all because now we're selling it. And now um, we can count on one hand the number of bugs we find in a given month. So the users, our new customers, they're hardly finding anything that's a problem. So it's solid. It's stable. It does what it says it does. And so, yeah, it was worth the time, but that was tough. Hmm. So you've got a lot of people out here listening that are going to be side hustlers that have the ambitions to do something on the tech side, whether it be an app or um, a more comprehensive SaaS product, whatever it may be. Can you give some some pointers maybe from your experience on Starting a SaaS, finding, it may be more in particular, finding a, a founder, whether maybe the person listening, like you said, is the business side, but non-technical or they're technical and not the business side. Um, you guys somehow found nine people to, to get this thing off the ground with. Um, mm -hmm. So what is, what's some advice that maybe you can give to someone looking for that partner? Well, there's a lot, but... Um... For me, this is, I've been looking for years for it, um, and I haven't found it yet. So um, it helped that were several of them that I knew well, and I could judge their character. Um, that was one. The point about them respecting, even if they don't understand the other side, is really important. Um, like I said, that that's something that was remarkably rare in all the startups that I talked to. Um, so knowing somebody, and, and so yeah, obviously you need to have a business founder and you need to have a technology founder if you're going to start a tech company. You have to have both. Buying either one of them at retail or trying to work with somebody who's a freelancer who's not really in the boat with you, the retail, it's ridiculously expensive. It'll never happen. And somebody who's sort of freelancing and not in the boat with you is not going to work out, right? They're not going to be committed. So you really need to have a minimum of those two. We're, we're very fortunate to have a wide range of skill sets in our large founding team. And it took, you know, it took a while to find that. But if you can find it, that's, that's pretty good. So for people that, may not have these people or to the left or to the right of them right now. Would you recommend like going out to networking events like in your town or is there like any places online? Like how can people start developing this, this network in that could potentially be their founder or partner down the road? So we're based here in Kansas city, in Kansas city in the last five years, maybe 10 years has had this, interesting renaissance that's occurred and being a tech entrepreneur is so we have the Royals and the Chiefs and Kansas City Sporting they all do pretty well in their major league categories you know if you can't be a, a Royals baseball player or or play soccer for sporting if you're a tech entrepreneur you're almost at that level <laughs> we love tech uh, tech startups here in Kansas City so we have a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of networking events there's a lot of mentorship there's a lot of just hanging around and drinking beers and sharing experiences from people who have been successful or who are struggling, you know, to figure it out. 
Um, those are really good. I've seen connections made with those. Um, one of the things that Real Quantum does is we're also trying to build the next generation. So our CEO is a mentor with one of the local um, boot camp schools. It's called Launch Code. And he's volunteering at one of those uh, Tech Week um, uh, hackathons coming up in a couple of weeks. And he's connecting entrepreneurs. So just last Saturday, when everybody else was in the office, he had um, a lady who had a product idea and another developer who was in the Launch Code program and a third person. I don't even know who that person was. And they were all in the conference room for a couple of hours. And she was, she had her Microsoft Surface up there. She was doing her pitch presentation to the other folks. And, and he's trying to look for, to create those connections. And not sure where that one will go, but that's that's the kind of stuff we're also doing. We see a lot of. So it is, I'm sure it is possible to connect. One of the things, I guess, out of that that I would just caution people is, is that they want to just go in carefully. So I spent a lot of time talking with the parts of my founding team that I didn't know yet and asking the people I did, so how well do you know these people? What have you done with them before? How do you feel about it? Before I dove in, because the first thing I had to do was write a check <laughs> to buy my share of the company. So I've got three questions to wrap this up with. The first question is, um, have you had any challenges with uh, your your day job conflicting with the side hustle and possibly how people may view you having this on the side? Because you're not keeping it a secret. It's on your LinkedIn. It's out there. People know you're a part of this. Has there been any conflict there? Good question. Uh, there's not. Um, so the first thing that I did is I talked to my CEO and I said, this is what this is happening. And I said, I wanted to make sure that he understood that my, my job here is my job and um, not to worry about it interfering. I'm going to be doing it on my own time, things like that. Um, I've got a lot of responsibilities here. So I told him, I said, you know, at some point in the future, my goal is, of course, to make that my full time job. We will have a conversation long before that happens. <laughs> so there's no surprises. I told him, I said, I was friends with you um, for 12 years before I got this job. I intend on being friends with you for 12 to 20 or 30 years after. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's the goal. And, and that has been the case, right? So um, it's a lot of demands on my time. Um, and if any of those things falls out of balance, if there's struggles at home or there's something crazy that happens with this job that demands me to work 70 hours a week or something like that, something we'll have to give. Um, but uh, that's how I did. I, I wanted to go out in the beginning and set the expectations and, ensure that I didn't have any divided loyalties with them. And, um, and I, and I watched that very carefully. So my next question is, well, first off, a lot of people, when they, they ask, where do you see yourself there? Where do you see yourself in three years, five years? And you get these kind of pie in the sky type answers. Mm -hmm. So right. I want to bring it back a little bit more realistic. And my question to you is, where do you see yourself and real quantum one year from now? Um, that we have established a rhythm of scale, right? A, a cadence of growing our customer base um, in a steady fashion, that the uh, items in our, in our roadmap are being achieved, um, and that that's, that's working well, that we have our product market fit and we continue to grow. Um, but otherwise, as far as my work here in my day job, that will remain my side hustle. My goal is in two years for that to become my full-time job. It's an amazing goal. I, I'm, uh, I added you on LinkedIn earlier, and I'll, I'll find how to follow you some more. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to watch that grow. And, and my last question to you is, for, for those people that are on the fence that have thought about starting something on the side, whether it be, you know, just a blog or an actual SaaS product, whatever it is, what words of advice can you give to someone who's on the fence? It's like, 
you know, I should do this, but I don't think I have time or, or whatever the excuse going through their head right now may be. Well, some people don't have time, but most people do have more time than they think. But you got to do something that you really are, are love and are passionate about, because then it won't. It, um, I don't I don't work 10 hours in another office on a Saturday and come drag my butt into work on Monday morning. I feel refreshed and energized on Monday. It's a change of pace, but it's doing something I love doing. So it is feeding my energy. It's not sucking it away. And um, that's, that's what it, that's what, whatever that pursuit is. Um, and a, a blog or being a volunteer or actually starting your own company or your own nonprofit for that matter, right? Um, it has to be something you're passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, it's often uh, I have to uh, explain to my girlfriend that I she's like, why are you working so much? And to me, it's not work. I actually love doing this. It, it, n never when I get in front of this computer, whether I'm writing a blog, working on my physical product or doing a podcast, do I does it ever cross my mind that I'm working? So, uh, and I think that just goes to your point of find something you're really passionate about and the hours don't seem like work. Right. And I know it's a cliche, right? You know, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But um, I, I would absolutely have given this up long ago if it felt you know, like a drudgery at all. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. So where can the listeners find more about Real Quantum and uh, yourself? Yeah, so um, realquantum.com is the website, and our about page has our list of uh, awesome, brilliant founders, and um, we'd love for them to check it out. Very cool. And you're obviously on LinkedIn as well. I found you on there, and uh, I appreciate uh, your time, Jeff, and you coming on, sharing your knowledge, and uh, sharing where you guys are with Real Quantum and where you're about to take it to. Great. It was great to talk to you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Take care. Thanks for hanging around. I hope you enjoyed that episode. The SaaS business model is the holy grail in the business world now because you can get paid on a monthly, or in Jeff's case, yearly basis and have a clear picture for what your revenue will be each month. There are more and more companies moving towards this model, Adobe being a great example. Previously, you bought each individual program once and it was yours forever. Now they operate on a recurring payment model and you pay them each month for whatever programs you're using. So, do you have a SaaS side hustle? Send me an email to hello at gritandhustle.co. I'd love to hear about it. Until next time, keep hustling my friends.